It's today. It's today it ends. Today it ends. In our region over the last couple of years, we lost Miss Jew under some extraordinary circumstances. <coughs> we had two people in this town, run, Aboriginal people, run down by a non-Aboriginal person who ran off the road and run down and got four years jail, two years jail for each. We now have Joyce Clark. We have Elijah. Every time we have deaths of this magnitude, we get in the street, we march like we did the other day. What do we want? Justice for Joyce. When do we want it? Now. Now we know the police have a tough job, but there's something very wrong in the way that police treat Aboriginal people in Western Australia. And in particular, vulnerable Aboriginal people, women and children. How is it then that in Sydney, a murderer, a man with a knife, can be taken down with a chair and a milk crate? But a very ill, vulnerable woman in Geraldton ends up dead at, at the hands of police. You have to compare and contrast what happened in Geraldton to what happened in Sydney by non-professionals. You know, they weren't even trained, but they managed to subdue an armed, violent murderer without killing him. And yet in WA, a vulnerable 29-year-old woman ends up dead. Now, Joyce's death should not be in vain. There needs to be an urgent review and reform of the protocols and training of police in these situations. There needs to be a focus on de-escalation in situations of mental health crises. And, as um, Sandy's mentioned earlier, it should be health workers who are first responders in medical crisis, not police, who are not equipped and trained for those situations. She died at the hands of a police officer who fired uh, a gun, who discharged a bullet and her life was lost. There's the principle of proportionality. There's the principle of proportionality. And those protocols that actually align the principle of proportionality need to be understood. There was no reason for that police officer to pull a gun and discharge that gun. She wasn't carrying a firearm. The principles of proportionality should uh, not permit anyone to pull a firearm, a police officer, uh, if there isn't a firearm in possession of the individual. That needs to tighten up the protocol to the point that that discretion is removed. That discretion doesn't remain to allow for rogue behavior. That proportional principle must be understood and reflected 100% in terms of protocols. I want, I've been involved and I want you to look at the cases of um, Miss Du, uh, Tamika Mullaly and her baby Charlie. Um, you've got Ms Manajara and many others, you know, uh, Sandy's mentioned others too. Drivers running off the road to, to kill people. In the Gascoigne Murchison Midwest region in 2019, we had seven suicides one as young as 12, and of those seven, two have happened in the last six days. We've had the police shoot uh, a woman attending a non-criminal uh, incident. Uh, so that gives us eight uh, deaths that take us to the level where we are today. The reason we have in this press conference, thanks to Jerry Georgiotis, is that we want to have it in Jordan to highlight what's happening in our region, uh, or more to the point, what's not happening in our region compared to other regions in Western Australia. It would be a safe bet to say that we have the highest rate of suicide in the state this calendar year, by far. Yet we haven't seen a state government minister or a federal minister we haven't seen state government departments or federal government departments to address this issue. We want the, federal, uh, the state government to now start rolling out uh, funding for services for after hours call. At the moment, between the hours of 4.30 in the afternoon and 8 p.m. 8 in the morning, the police are the only respondents 
that we can call, whether it's a criminal matter, whether it's a non-criminal matter, we need to have other departments who have 24-hour services. It's not new, it's not new. Department of Child Protection in, the, in years past had offices on 24-hour call. The West Australian Legal Service, I've had offices on 24-hour call. And one might ask, uh, why does the Aboriginal Legal Service do that now? Well, I think Dennis will answer that by saying, well, talk to our funding agencies, right? It's got nothing to do with the service, it's to do with the resources that uh, the Aboriginal Legal Service of Western Australia don't get. We've got to have mental health and suicide prevention funding generated away from non-Aboriginal, non-government service providers and that funding be allocated to the community control health sector in our region and across the state. So, something has to change in the way that we're actually doing this, doing the um, things that we are at the moment, because what we're doing at the moment is it, 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 is, it isn't working. Um, one of the things I'd like to see is that currently we have a suicide critical um, um, get pretty good team. So what that basically means is is when there is an unexplained death in our community, we're all called together and we are we are briefed on the incident and then we are required to actually work together to tackle the issues from that from the fallout from that event. But I'd, what I'd like to see is another separate group or a group that's expanded and remodeled and redeveloped whereby if any serious events such as this, which is what happened to Ms. Clark, then community are actually called together by the police and other um, responsible agencies to deal and talk about strategies on how we can address some of the, the issues that are going to be impacted on by with community um, with the events that have just happened. We want this to stop. We don't want to be in a country that treats us the way that we're treated and it's got to stop and it's got to stop now. Um, I don't know what it is that we continue to have to suffer abuse, being shot, crying out for help. And it shouldn't be us sitting up here as Aboriginal people saying enough is enough. It should be the community should be outraged. Non-Aboriginal people should be outraged. They should be looking at what's going on and saying enough is enough. We can't let this continue to happen. Let's do something about it. And we, we want that to happen. We know it doesn't happen because people are allowed to get away with abusing us, discriminating against us, and, uh, and shooting us. But the federal and state government must now start taking responsibility to ensure that they address the uh, mental health and depression and suicide prevention of Aboriginal people in this country and in this region. My understanding is up until last week, I think 110 Aboriginal people around this country this year have taken their own lives, many of them under the age of 18. Now, how many people in the general public know about that? Because the government buries these things. The last four years of this federal government, 10,000 people around this country have taken their own lives. 21 men a week take their own lives because they can't access their children. Why is the government burying all this? The stats are very clear, and I'm sure Jerry can give you a lot more details than I can. But we need to address the police situation in our region at the moment. I raised it with the superintendent, and uh, the majority of police in this state are good iron working police officers. The only problem with them is when, we, when they have bad ones, instead of the police department getting rid of them, they protect them. And how they protect them is they transfer them somewhere else. So they transfer the problem somewhere else and they say, oh, well, we got rid of him out of jail. But what's the good of getting rid of him out of jail and you're going to send him to Megathower or somewhere like that? There has to be some strong uh, uh, legislation around police who aren't suitable to be part of the police force. And it is evident, it is evident from what happened to uh, Miss Clark, Joyce, that the police don't have any negotiation skills and obviously they haven't been trained in negotiation. They certainly don't have any medical skills and that's why if we had our 24-hour services, 
we would be the first respondents to a non-criminal matter. And then it would be the mental health practitioners who would then determine whether it, we required the support of police. We have to stand strong for our community that's missing out. We have too many people who are suffering in pain and in silence in their own homes. Now, if people don't know what they're doing in terms of government-funded programs, get out of the way. Let people that know what they're doing, because what we're seeing right now in terms of suicide, it's a suicide crisis throughout this country. Now, for every suicide, there's 70 attempts. So what's happening to the, to the people that aren't getting that service, where there is that un, unaddressed trauma? That is beyond the joke. Now, working at the coalface every single day, and you hear the hardships, and it's a poverty narrative. The other thing, too, to remember is that mandatory sentencing laws. I'd like to talk about that for a moment. Mandatory sentencing law is further creating <coughs> hardship for our people. It's taking away the discretion of the judges, the magistrates, not taking into account the personal circumstances of the individual that's coming into contact with the criminal justice system, hence their high incarceration rate. When does it stop? The incarceration rate, housing, we're looking at children being removed from care, it is unprecedented right now. And if we don't stand up for our people who are suffering every single day in their homes, what good is it of having all these rep bodies? What good of it is it having all these wonderful organisations when it doesn't translate to the people on the ground? That's a problem. We see this group getting paid, this group getting funded, this group getting funded, but it is our people where it's a poverty narrative that are missing out and that don't reap the, result, reap, uh, the rewards. They give to, just recently, this federal government gave $22 million, an additional $22 million to four research agencies around this country based on suicide prevention and suicide. When are we going to actually start delivering mm -hmm. the services? We don't see those reports. We don't know what's contained in it. And I understand there was a report done recently uh, that the government hadn't even read the 60 recommendations, yet he's called for another uh, report. We are losing so many of our children. It is just, it's hard to comprehend it's hard to comprehend. And there wouldn't but with the seven suicides that we've had in this region this year, there wouldn't be one Yamaji person in this region who isn't is it touched in some way or another. Not one of us. And there's eight thousand of us. There wouldn't be one. The governments know all this. You know, the government departments. The government departments are burying this and the reason they're burying it because the minister has allowed them to do it. They don't know how to deal with it, and they don't have the 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 they don't have the expertise, they don't have the common decency to come and talk to those service providers in the community who can have the who have the solutions and can work with our communities. Where does the research end? And where does the research end? And where does the service delivery start? That, that, that's all we want to know. If, if and, and to further add to that, Sandy, so what we've had nationally is 70-odd reports. That are quite supporting 100 recommendations. So what, we know what the, what the answers are. There's been enough consultation. But what we're not seeing is the money hit the ground to the people that need it most. There is an unmet need, and we need to address this. There's a whole issue about people sitting in their homes, and like I said in earlier part, suffering in silence. No hope. We need to give people hope. Now what happened last week, or a couple of weeks ago here, we've, that is absolutely catastrophic. It should have not happened. We should have had people like, like the guys were saying up here, it shouldn't have been the police that went to the house. It should have been someone like a service who can go in there, they're trained, they can de-escalate the situation. And we should have been helping this young one. And that's what we do on a daily basis with many of our people children have taken their lives in this country. The youngest suicides this year nationally are 12 years of age. But the youngest attempts, and that's six, that's six children, uh, three of them in WA. So half those 12 year olds, three of them are in WA. One a non-Indigenous child and, and two First Nations children. Shouldn't be, shouldn't be, shouldn't be imaginable, shouldn't be comprehensible, shouldn't be possible in this country. But, w, but the youngest attempts, which are getting younger and younger, 
I've worked with two six-year-olds. I never thought that would ever be the day. Two six-year-olds who attempted, who actually attempted suicide, and I've just returned from somewhere that I won't identify, working with a seven-year-old child that attempted suicide, and he's been left with various impairment because of that. It's a crisis, and our state, territories, and Commonwealth governments need to own it. Not just make commitments, not just promise by the hour, but deliver by the minute. The custody notification scheme was a recommendation of the Royal Commission of the Aboriginal Deaths in Custody nearly 30 years ago. And the fact that it's only being introduced into WA now is a scandal. And people have died as a result of not having a, a custody notification scheme. And I'm very pleased to see that the ALS is now leading that charge and I think they'll be saving lives. Just as um, if mental health services were able to be provided at a first responder uh, a service um, after hours, you would probably see less shootings. 31 years ago, 31 years ago in New South Wales, it's taken 31 years to get some amendments to the Fines Enforcement Act to prohibit the first port of call uh, of jail by a Fines Enforcement Registrar to issue a warrant of commitment. 31 years, 31 years, and the legislative changes haven't gotten through Parliament yet. They've got to go through two houses. We've still got that little bit of a way. But let's not forget that the reason that people cannot pay these fines is because they cannot afford these fines. The next step should have been income-sized assessment of these fines, uh, income-sized fines according to income bracket. The Scandinavians do not jail the poor. Australia does, and Western Australia at an even higher rate. Austra Western Australia remains the backwater of this nation. One in five, one in five of all First Nations people living in Western Australia have been to prison. One in five, that's an abomination. Moral, political, it's reprehensible, diabolical. One in five. But if you're living below the poverty line and living in Western Australia and our First Nations, one in three have been to prison. Western Australia remains a backwater. The only way it can be redressed is by legislative changes, by laws being redressed, repaired, by new laws that are compassionate, and by systemic changes in all our health layers. And that means, for the foremost, the one thing that I will argue above all others, in addition to primary, secondary, and allied health care, is that outreach workers are the major port of call of investment from here onwards. Outreach workers. You can't do things without an in-person support. You can't do things without an on-tap nature in terms of 24-7. Outreach, psychosocial expertise should have been at that door of that household of Miss Clark on that day. She would be with us here today and she would be supported here today. I'm going to make a comment that will be damning not just of police but of society because the police shouldn't have had to respond to that incident, to the distress of that household. Had I or Megan Cracker or Sandy Davies or Deb Woods been contacted to respond to that household, Miss Clark would still be alive today. Police uh, need to rebuild trust with the community or build trust with the community. From what Sandy tells me, there is no trust and there's never been trust. They need to reach out to communities and listen to what people like Sandy and Debbie and Dennis uh, have to say, because they know what's good for their communities, but the police have a top-down militaristic approach. They think they know better, and that's what leads to tragic deaths like Ms. Du, like Charlie Mullaly, and like Joyce Clark. There needs to be reform of the laws that give police enormously broad powers which are performed in a discriminatory and prejudiced way. You give police broad powers and guess what? They are taking out their broad powers on vulnerable communities and particularly Aboriginal communities in WA. There needs to be transparency and accountability. If you're going to build trust with Aboriginal communities, you need to have transparency. There's no hiding information from the community behind the coroner's inquest. People need to know what is going on and what happened as quickly as possible. Officers need to wear body cams, as, as Sandy suggested, and they need to be on all the time. They, there needs to be an independent inquiry 
into Joyce's death. Not one undertaken by police. Aboriginal communities will not trust an inquiry if it's police reviewing the actions of police. It needs to be independent. And we'll be working with the family to ensure that there is accountability at all stages of this process. And like Sandy, we will not stop until there's change. If I just say one last thing, because I'm just reflecting on a young boy that died here in Geraldton several years ago. And I know it's still close at heart, the grief. His name, he was 10 years old, he was 11 actually. He was 11 years old, his name was Peter Little. Peter Little. He died needlessly. He died because of systemic failures. He died because our state government did not do all the things that we're actually asking of him today. So how many more young children, older individuals such as him, others, Miss Clark, is it going to take? I warned at that time that that young boy's mother was at risk, that that young boy's mother was at risk. Nine months later, his mum took her life. His mum took her life. The state government heard those calls and those cries and those warnings and those alerts from myself and from people, others like myself. Yet nothing was put in place. Miss Manglamara, 10 years old, died in Luma. A Kalambaru child that died in Luma on May 9, 2016. The services had failed her too, exactly the same as the services had failed the young Peter Little boy because the services weren't supported, didn't have the outreach, didn't have the capacity, didn't have the resources that only government can provide. So I don't forget young Peter Little. I don't forget. And young Peter Little is buried very close to Miss Jew. And it's been said that the custody notification service was galvanized as a result of Miss Dew's death on August 4, 2014. I received calls that day from both sides of the families and it was a pronounced tragedy. It was an avoidable tragedy. It should never have happened. But in fact, the calls for the custody notification service began three years prior for Western Australia, three years prior. Had those calls been heeded, Miss Dew would still be alive today. Miss Dew was incarcerated or locked up in that police watch house because of unpaid fines. She would be with us today as others who will be lost most definitely in the years to come, in the days, weeks, months, years to come, will be lost unless what we're calling for today is heeded.